sure makes parenting babies and toddlers look beautiful and idyllic, right? Like, I even want the, the crayon art on my wall. Like, she did a great job. It's beautiful. Um, what the video didn't show was the sleepless nights or the diaper blowouts or the, the tantrums or the piles of laundry and dishes that never end and the seemingly near constant trail of sickness that follows your family every time you leave the house, right? Like, they, they left that part out. I don't know why. It's, it's so nice. Um, but no, I, st I still love that video. I, I love the, the concept of phase. We're going to be talking about that over the next uh, four weeks starting today. Um, but it, it encapsulates something true, something important. And, um, and, and we're going to watch that little girl grow up over the next four weeks. Each, each week, pay attention before the sermon because she's going to grow up. So bring your tissues. Um, but we're talking about this, this idea of how kids... Uh, they, they change, right? There, there's seasons to, to kids, whether it's easy or hard, good or bad, beautiful or ugly, stressful or peaceful, challenging or simple, crowded or lonely, whether they're learning to walk or learning to drive, whether they're keeping you up at night because they need a diaper change or because you're waiting for them to get home from a friend's house. Parents in the room, I need you to hear me. It's just a phase, all right, it will pass. That, that means for the phases that are tough, all you have to do is hold on and it will get better. But it also means that when the, when the seasons are good, when, when something beautiful is happening, don't blink, right? Because it's, it's going to go by quick. And um, so the reason that we want to talk about that is so that we, we don't miss it, right? We want to leverage each phase to its fullest potential. And the reason we're talking about it in this room is because that's true for the church, too. It's true for the way we disciple kids, because kids learn differently at different phases of development. The way we disciple at different phases matters, all right, so we took that video from a group called Orange, and they also wrote a book called It's Just a Phase, So Don't Miss It, and, and they define phase this way. They say a phase is a time frame in a kid's life when you can leverage distinctive opportunities to influence their future. And I think we would all agree the most important part of their future that we want to influence is their faith. Right? So each phase is an opportunity, a time frame when you can leverage different opportunities to influence their future and their faith. And if you've been here for any stretch of time, you've probably heard me talk about Orange in the past. I, I talk about this a lot, the idea that the church and parents should be working together to influence the faith of the youngest generation. Uh, you might have even heard us use the phase wording before. Uh, but as a church staff, we started realizing it's important every so often to have a little refresher course to remind the church congregation uh, what we're doing in family ministry here at FCC, what's happening across the hall in FCC kids and down the hall on Sunday nights in FCC students to let you all in, not just on what we do, but why we do it the way that we do it. All right. So over the next four weeks, we have two primary goals for this sermon series. Goal number one is we simply want to share our strategy for youngest generation discipleship. We, we want to crack the door open and let you in on, on why we do what we do. Um, if nothing else, we want you to see what we're doing as a church so that you can support it and prioritize the discipleship of the youngest generation. Because I think it's easy, um, especially if you yourself don't have kids and you're not currently volunteering on either our kids or our students ministry teams. Um, it, it's easy to accidentally get left out of the loop on what's going on. Um, that's not your fault. It's just, it's just life sometimes. And, and, and so you, you maybe come to this, this room and sitting here and, and, and maybe you are serving other places. You're, you're involved. It's not that you're not trying to be involved in the life of the church, but maybe you don't have a window in to what's going on in the other half of the building. And, and sometimes I think we as adults, and I'll, I count myself, I think I count myself as an adult, um, but like also even in, in this mistake, we, we make a mistake sometimes, a mentality mistake, a, a def definition mistake, in that we sometimes fall into the trap of saying, I went to church because we went to this room, or, or that I, I believe the church is what happens in this room. 
And like, yeah, we may know mentally that our church as an organization has other stuff going on, but we, we, make a, we make an error if we limit our understanding and our perspective on what church is to what happens in this room. Right? Um, and, and again, this isn't something that, that you're doing on purpose, right? I'm the family pastor. I, I have five kids of my own, and I catch myself starting to think that way. Right? When I have to prepare a sermon for this room, there is something, about, something in my brain that says that's higher stakes. I need to work harder on that, put more hours into that, more study and effort into that than I do for the message I'm preparing for students. Or, or when Emma asks me to, to fill in for, for one of her large group teachers and kids, I'm just like, yeah, just hand me the curriculum. I, can, I don't even need to read it before I get there. It's like I, I think that that stuff doesn't matter as much as this stuff. And that's wrong. That's not true. I mean, even if we just look at this uh, numerically, we'll start to get a different understanding. Okay, so in our church, not the church, not the church in America, not the church in the West, this church, okay, Fortville Christian Church, we have 94 members and attenders, that is regular, consistent participants in the life of our church who are age 18 and younger. That's 29.1% of our total membership and attendance. So that means that on any given Sunday, the event that's happening in this room right now is only including a little less than three quarters of our church. Right? There's, there's about a quarter of us somewhere else in the building, not in here. All right, this would be like if we were a family of four gathering at the dinner table, mom, dad, one kid, and one kid stays in their room, and we're like, oh, it's so good to have the family together. I would make a middle child joke, but I said that there was only two kids. But it's like we forget about that one, right? Like, it's okay. They're in their room. They're, but no, they're, where's the whole family? And, and I'm not suggesting that, um, that, that we bring the whole family in here all the time, right? That's how some churches handle it. Some churches say we don't want to exclude the youngest generation. We want them to be part of the life of our church. We want them to hear what's going on. We want them to benefit from seeing their parents worship. I think there are good motives for that. But here's the thing. Because I believe in the concept of phases, we don't do that here. Now, if you want your kids to sit with you, that's fine. There's kids in this room right now. There were kids in this room last service. They are welcome here all the time. But because I believe, and we as a family ministry and a church staff and a leadership believe that kids and students learn differently at different phases of development than adults, that's why we have prioritized making other environments for them to learn in. Because they're going to hear the message differently than you and I want to hear the message. It's not, we don't have those rooms and those programs going because we just want to keep them out of our hair in here. Because, you know, we, we want it quieter. We don't like all the noise that those babies make. And so we don't want them in this room because we need to listen to the sermon. We, we have them in those rooms because we believe that they will learn better in those rooms. Because we value them so much, we're prioritizing creating a space for them to learn about Jesus. So that's why we do that. Now, they are always welcome in this room. They're part of the family. It's not us versus them, but we can't forget that they're down the hall. Right? So just in a practical sense, we want you to know what's going on so that if nothing else, you can support it in prayer. You can have a better understanding of what the needs and the challenges are for making disciples in the youngest generation because it's, it affects a significant portion of our church body, right? 29%. That's just the kids themselves. We start attaching the parents and families that belong to those 29%. This is a gigantic portion of our church body that we're talking about. All right, so that's goal number one. Share our strategy for youngest generation discipleship. Goal number two, we want to give you tools to participate in it. And now before you start getting uncomfortable and squirming and thinking, oh no, we have to listen for four weeks. Matt says we need to serve in kids ministry. No, that's not what I'm doing, but if you're interested, we always have spots available. You can talk to... It actually worked first service, you guys. I didn't think it would. Somebody came up after first service and asked them if they could join the team. Boom! Amazing! We still have spots, but that's not what this is about. That's not what this is about. If, it, if it's what it's about for you, that's amazing. But this is about so much more than just volunteering in family ministry. This is, this is even more than just being a parent and a disciple maker in your own home. 
right? This, this is something, a strategic approach to next generation discipleship is something that takes every single one of us. Every one of us. So over the next four weeks, starting today, you're going to hear from each one of the family ministry staff. Okay, so you're going to hear from me this week. Um, and then next week, you're going to hear from Emma Flick. She's our kids ministry director. And then you'll hear from Gavin Privet, our student ministry intern. And the last week of the series, someone else you know and love, Pastor Rob Rigsby. And on this slide, I've labeled him the adult ministries pastor. Now, don't, don't worry. We didn't change his title. But we're talking about phases, right? So I think it's important to remind us all, we're in a phase, right? It's called adulthood. And and there's a few phases even inside of adulthood, right? But lump us all together, we're in a phase. And I think Pastor Rob generally is responsible and does an okay job at leading and pastoring us, right? So so we're going to hear from him too. Um, but we're going we're gonna to be looking at, at this also it phases and then also our three core beliefs. You hear us talk about our three core beliefs all the time, um, and, and I'm, I'm not going to get too deep into it right now, but we, we teach those three core beliefs in every phase that we lead as well. But what you'll see over the course of this series is that those beliefs also lend themselves as a natural progression of growing up. All right. And, and so we're going to talk today about our strategy and our philosophy for how we minister to kids and families in early childhood, how that phase is all about identity formation. It's about understanding that God loves them, that they are part of his family. We want our youngest kids to know that Jesus made them to be with him. That's the way in FCC kids, we refer to our first core belief And here. We say, What exactly? We believe that you need Jesus every day. In kids, we say we believe that Jesus made you to be with him. It's the same thing. And we want them to know that from the earliest age. We're going to get to act that out a little bit today after the sermon. We've got child dedication today. Then next week, Emma's going to talk about the elementary phase, how that's really, that's all about inviting kids into the life of the church, widening the circle of influence in the context of small groups, right? You can't do life alone. So this is about finding belonging, that Jesus wants them to love others and be in community with them, that they need other voices and fellow partners with them on the journey of discipleship, and they belong in the family of God. And then week three, we're going to hear from Gavin. He's going to talk about student ministry, how how that's the phase where we start to get some wheels on this thing, and and we're moving into the third core belief. And in kids, we talk about this one saying, Jesus helps me do big things. In student ministry, we just talk about the big one single word of purpose. Right? A few months ago, Rob walked us through three core beliefs using identity, belonging, and purpose. That's the language we use in student ministry. And, And so he's going to talk about how faith is likelier to stick into adulthood if we connect their faith to something bigger than themselves, if, if we help them find the mission that God has invited them to be a part of, right? And then last week, the last week, uh, week four, Pastor Rob's going to close us out talking about us, talking about adults, bringing us back to this idea of next generation discipleship being a whole church endeavor, that we are all in this together. Again, we're not, we're not cutting you know, those people off and sending them down the hall. We're not, we're not sending parents out on their own. This, this is a whole church endeavor. This is the phase as adults where all three of those core beliefs start to work together so that we can pass faith to the youngest generation. And you've heard the saying, it takes a village to raise a child. I would suggest we change it. It takes a church to make a disciple. Right? Parents get the the weighty responsibility of being the primary disciple maker, but they're not the only disciple maker. We got to come along and link arms and support and come with them and and pray for them and hold them up when that's hard. This is a whole church deal. And and that's why in, in both FCC kids and FCC students, we have the same mission statement. It is that we exist to partner with parents to lead the youngest generation to love and follow Jesus, right? And that partnership piece is key, right? Our ultimate goal is for the youngest generation to love and follow Jesus, but to make that happen best, we as a church have to link arms with the family to to build discipleship. And so this series is all about explaining the heart behind the why, the practical strategy behind the how of that partnership. We're asking the question, how can we as a whole church better support and equip and encourage parents 
in their role as disciple makers? What does that look like? And now I get to ask the specific question, what does that look like in the early childhood phase? Right, the phase of diapers and naps and tears and energy and exhaustion at the same time and tiny shoes and big emotions. Right, like what, what does discipleship look like in the early childhood phase? And I'll be completely honest with you. I'm a parent in this phase, and I, I don't always know what it looks like. Right, I'm just trying to survive and keep my kids alive. Right, like it, it's I, I, it, how is this discipleship? Right, the, the phase where you say things like "Get that out of your mouth." Don't stick your finger in that. Put that down. Pick that up. Right? Stop crying. Come here. Wear this. Let go of that. Why is everyone screaming, including me? Where's discipleship fitting into all that? Oh, yeah, Jesus. Like, we're, I mean, it's hard sometimes. I can't sit with my babies and explain theology to them, right? I'm, I'm not, we're not having conversations about original sin and atonement and regeneration. Like, it's not happening. So where's the discipleship? And honestly, ministry for this phase at church brings a lot of the same questions, right? If you're a leader in either our infants and toddlers room or our threes and fours room, would you please stand right now? Infants and toddlers, threes and fours. There's a couple of you. There was like four or five in here first service, and they're all back on the other side now. Thank you. Give them a hand. So you guys know that on the weeks that we have like 13 babies or, or you know, 12 three-year-olds, like two weeks ago, I walked into the infant room. They, I, that's a real number. We had 13 babies two weeks ago. And I walked in, and all of the leaders were sitting on the floor with like three children on them. How is discipleship happening, you may ask, right? Like, and I'm sure they were asking the same thing. It's the same thing I just described. We're just trying to keep kids alive. Like, we're, we're just trying, you know, what, what are we doing? And I, what I want to suggest to you, leaders and parents, and I'll, I'll get to you in a little bit, if you have the right posture, if you have the right posture, ministry and discipleship can happen in that chaos, Okay, and, and to explain that, I want to take you to Jesus and what he says about little kids. So if you would turn with me to Matthew chapter 18, right, the disciples, they come to Jesus, they're arguing. Um, and and this, it says this, Matthew 18, verse one, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and they asked, so who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Right? And so Matthew here in, in his account, he's not, um, he's not very specific about what they're doing. He's, I think he's being nice to them. He, he makes it sound like they're just making a general inquiry. Um, but Mark isn't so kind. In, in, in Mark 9, 33, he tells the same story. He says, they came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, Jesus asked them, what were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent because on the way they had been arguing with one another about who of them was the greatest. All right, so these guys, there's a little bit of misplaced motivation, a little bit of self-promotion going on. Um, there's other instances where the disciples are arguing about who's going to sit on Jesus' right and on his left when he's on his throne. And if you're here on Good Friday, you remember the guys who are on Jesus' right and on his left while he's getting enthroned on the cross, they got crucified. So I don't think they knew what they were asking for, um, but the disciples, they think a lot of themselves, like we all do. Right? And so they're asking, who's the greatest? Who's the greatest? Jesus answers uh, in, in verse 3. He says, truly I tell you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child, this one is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one child like this in my name welcomes me. All right, there's two things I want us to, to get from this this morning. First, let's read verse 4 again. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child, this one is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. All right, this, this week when I was preparing for this sermon, I was going to skim over this verse. I was going to say, hey, freebie, be humble. It's obvious. Move on. And then I realized, I think this is actually, this might be the most important verse. Whoever humbles himself like this child this one is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Right? I, I think there is an implication here that has everything to do with what we're talking about as it relates to phases and discipleship in early childhood. 
Because I would suggest to you that there is no phase that is less glamorous or more humbling than the early childhood phase. Right? I, I don't care what designer stroller you have, what cute clothes you put your baby in, this is the phase more than any other that immediately gets associated with bodily fluids and bad smells and gross things. Right? There's diapers and spit up and throw up and boogers. These are the hallmarks of early childhood. And Jesus is saying, if you humble yourself and be like that, you're the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean? mean? All right, well, I, I think it means that if you humble yourself and enter into that mess, if you take off your own pride, your own dignity, your own worth, and you exchange it for that child, you give them your dignity and worth. You are ascribing dignity and worth to that child. You're the greatest. Why does he say you're the greatest? I, I think it's because this is exactly what Jesus did for us. Jesus entered into our mess, our boogers, our sin. And he became like us, right? That's what he says. Whoever humbles himself like this child, whoever becomes like this child, is the greatest because you're acting out what Jesus did for you. That God the Father was looking at his children in their mess and they had no dignity and no worth and he had all dignity and worth as Lord of heaven and he said, I will take it off and I will give it to them. I will humble myself so that I will lift them up. And he says, this is what you're doing when you love little kids. It's an opportunity on a very small scale for you to act out the gospel. That you would act out what Jesus Christ did for you. Humble yourself. Lift them up. Sacrifice for them. Right? Because just a chapter later on in Matthew 19, the disciples mess this up again. All right, they, they don't get it. Some parents start bringing their babies to Jesus so that he can pray over them. And the disciples start to stop them and rebuke them, right? Like they're like, no, Jesus doesn't have time for this. He has real ministry to do. And Jesus is like, mm -mm. time out. Let those kids come to me. Bring those little children to me because that is real ministry. Your ministry isn't better than these little ones. You're not above this. And so he says to all of us, humble yourselves, ascribe your own dignity and worth, give it over to the youngest generation, lift them up, sacrifice for them, serve them, love them well. And, and if you do that, it brings us to the second observation out of verse five. When you give your dignity and your worth to the youngest members of the church, he says you're welcoming Jesus, whoever welcomes one child like this in my name, welcomes me. Right, this, is, this is what discipleship looks like in the early childhood phase. You're the first impressions team. Both, you know, you're, you're welcoming Jesus, he says. You're, you, but you're also the first impression that child will have of the church. You're the welcoming committee. And this is why you will hear me and, and members of the family ministry team. I'm sorry, you've heard this before. You're going to hear it again. You will hear me get on a soapbox and declare again and again that around here, we never use the word child care. It's never child care. That's a dirty word in this church. Because I don't care if you're sitting in a room with 13 babies and all you do is change diapers and rock criers and pick up toys and you never read a Bible verse, you never mention Jesus by name. In this church, if you are welcoming kids, you're doing ministry. You're giving them a place to feel safe and loved and welcomed and valued as part of the family of God. You're ascribing dignity and worth to our youngest family members. This is why in FCC Kids, we make such a big deal about our goal of having leaders who serve every single week. And we know that's hard. It's a hard ask. We, we believe that by seeing those same welcoming, safe faces week in and week out, that we are building a better connection with a kid. 
Right. And, and it's hard. It's a hard task. Right. Emma spends I don't know how many countless hours on the phone trying to recruit people to say yes to that ask. And this is I'm not picking on any of you. OK, because you're all sitting there like, ooh, I got one of those phone calls. I'm not picking on any of you because many of you have had to say, no, I can't do that commitment. And that's OK, because we know it's a huge commitment. It's, it's a lot of work for her. And there are times that we have asked ourselves, are we doing the right thing? Should we change our, the way we do this? Should we not make that requirement? But we keep coming back to the fact that we believe it's so important to build a place where kids are encountering not just a warm body, but a relationship. That they would know that face, that they would know that person, especially when we're talking about early childhood, this youngest age, right? Separation anxiety is a real thing. And it's real easy to do it with one consistent face instead of a different face every week. Maybe not real easy, easier. All right? And that's, so that's why we do that. That's, that's why we do what we do. We're, we're shaping that kid's understanding of the church. We're prioritizing the humbling work of loving them well. And when we do that, they are forming an identity that associates love, safety, and positivity with the church and by association, Jesus. We want to communicate to these kids simply by the way we greet them and smile at them and hold them and play with them and rock them when they're sad and feed them fishy crackers when they're hungry. Whatever it may be, it's an opportunity to communicate to them that Jesus made them to be with him. Jesus loves them. Jesus values them. He treasures them. And because he does, we do. And parents, parents in the room, if, if you are a parent of children age five and younger, would you please stand? Any of you left in here? Did they all exit to get ready for child dedication? <laughs> there you are. Hey, I need you to hear me. You, this is the same stuff for you guys. There's no special sauce that you're not doing that, that I'm yelling at you to figure out right now. Just keep loving your kids. When you love your kids the way that Jesus loves you, they will see Jesus. If you want your kids to encounter Jesus, just keep loving them. Okay, you're doing a good job. Keep it up. You can sit down. I have just scratched the tip of the iceberg here this morning. There's so much more I could say about Jesus and kids and early childhood. I didn't, I didn't get to the next part of the passage where Jesus says he's going to hang millstones around people's necks if they don't love kids well. Like, I didn't get that far. But that's why I'm excited for the rest of the series. Okay? We're going to hear from the rest of the, the staff about um, what they have to say in different areas of, of discipleship. Um, but, but here's, I think, the important takeaway that we need to remember. The church is always only one generation away from extinction. Right? That's a phrase you've heard. It's kind of depressing if you think about it too hard. Don't think about it. It's true. I don't believe it'll happen because Jesus promised it wouldn't happen. Right? The gates of hell will not prevail against my church, said Jesus. But if we want this church to retain influence and effectiveness in our community, in our culture, in our town. This has to be, I, I'm convinced this has to be priority number one. We have to make kids and teenagers the thing we care about most because the reality is, guys, the adult phase, we're already here. And we're getting older every day. And if we want this room to be full after we're gone... We need to care about kids. We want to pass on to them the, the, the truth and the hope of Jesus' saving work on their behalf because he didn't just die for us. He died for them too. If you didn't get your communion this morning, you can go get it from the back of the room. Um, and we're going we're gonna to take communion together in just a moment here. As we are passing on faith... So we're passing on our understanding of what Jesus has done for us. Let's keep that in mind, that exchange. 
Jesus' dignity for ours, right? He, he gave us himself and he invites us to do the same for the youngest generation. And on the night that he went to the cross, Jesus took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Each time you eat, remember me. Let's eat together. And then he took the cup and he said, this is my blood poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Each time you drink, remember me. Lord Jesus, I thank you so, so much that we have a, a church that includes 29% of young people. I am so grateful that this is a topic that we need to talk about because it means that we're, we're still in the fight. We're, we're still able to influence. And so I pray, God, I pray for every parent, every leader, everyone who is in those seats of primary influence, grandparents, aunts and uncles, guardians, whoever they are, God, I pray that you would sustain them, hold them up, encourage them in their discipleship work. And I pray too, God, for the rest of us in this room, maybe we're sitting on the outside of that. Maybe that's a few years in the past. Maybe it's a few years in the future. Maybe we don't know how to be involved. God, just the, the posture change to remember that it's going on and to support it and pray for it, God, I pray that you would Remind us to do that, that we, would, that we would prepare a space for these kids in our church body, that we would smile at them and wave at them when they come in, that we would put an arm around a, a mom or a dad who looks tired, that we would pray for them, that we would love them, we would take them a meal, we would just support them as they do that, that work. God, we pray these things in your name, Jesus, and everybody said, amen. Hi, I'm Pastor Rob, and I just want to thank you for joining us online today. And one of the things that we believe here at FCC is that you can't do life alone. And so while we're grateful for the technology that allows us to live stream and archive our services and sermons, the reality is that online pales in comparison to coming in person and being with people and, and interacting face to face. And so. Our encouragement to you is that uh, if you're local here, that you would come check us out in person and uh, we'd love to get to know you and help you get connected here. Uh, if, you're, if you're not local, then our encouragement is that you would find a church near where you are, that you can build relationships there. If you'd like more information about FCC or you'd like to give online or you'd like to submit a prayer request, or even let us know that you're coming this Sunday. You can do all that on our website, fortvillechristian.com. We would love to see you here.